Hutchie was a gifted artist and kept his creative mind active by painting at night and working during the day. One day, he came across an image of Raphael's Madonna and Child, one of the most well-known Italian Renaissance paintings of Mary and the infant Jesus. Hachi didn't know the name of that child in the mother's arms, but he was drawn to the peace he saw in the, in the child's eyes, which was, from his perspective, such a dramatic opposition, or in such a dramatic opposition to the social chaos he was experiencing during the Cultural Revolution. Hachi performed manual labor during the day, but at night he would paint a replica of the Madonna and child, working closely with the image, being attuned to its color, tone, shapes, and lines. As he worked with the image, he discovered the identity of that child. Today, Hachi follows the one whose image he sought to replicate. Hachi was the first mainland Chinese to earn a PhD in religious art after the Cultural Revolution. The Far Eastern Economic Review wrote, quote, today, Hachi ranks as arguably China's most internationally sought after contemporary Christian artist. <clears throat> That's because his brilliant, colorful, and highly contemporary paintings emerge unmistakably from Chinese contexts. Hachi's life illustrates that a non-discursive form of communication, in this case painting, has the power to capture the attention of a hurting world and fundamentally change one's orientation to life, a turn toward God. In closing, let me say this. We have everything to gain as we open ourselves to the humanities worldwide. Such a gain will require a double movement of conversion. It will require courage to turn toward the world and courage to turn the world toward God. But if we have the courage, then we can expect our students to be confident and equipped to engage the world as bearers of hope and good news. They would offer to the world their finest talents in the areas of ancient and modern languages, religious studies, history, visual and performing arts, music, communications, and global studies. Not just to be the very best in these areas, there are enough bright people in the world, but also to be agents of reconciliation, redemption, and hope. These are the things the world desperately needs. Our task, it seems to me, is not to produce the nicest people in town, but to equip our students to use their heads, hearts, and hands to encounter the world with purpose and resolve, stepping out with bold humility into the global community, animated by a spirit of anticipation and delight. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you for uh, to all of you who helped to organize this. Is that good? <laughs> and to all of you who put in a microphone that goes up and down. Um, it's just rare to be able to hear from one another in this way, so I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm from the English department. People in the humanities often encounter questions, some of them snide, some of them quite serious, Sort of like, why read Chaucer at a time like this? The world is in a lot of trouble. Is Canterbury Tales necessary? Or why read a poem at a time like this? An econ major some years ago, very nice young woman, came into my office hours after about three weeks of haplessly having been consigned to my upper division poetry course because she couldn't fit any other English requirements into her schedule. And she tried very hard to be respectful, but she sort of shuffled her feet and said, um, I don't know how to ask this without being impertinent, but why do people do this? <laughs> Meaning, why do people spend their time poring over poetry, analyzing the words, looking at the images? And the feeling I had when she asked that question was that I appreciated her courage for coming, and I also thought she deserved an answer. And the answer to that has occupied me for quite some years since then. I think the why question is tremendously important. Um, and my answer is not that poetry is uplifting or inspiring, though much poetry is, but rather that what literary study and similarly some of the other humanities 
offer is a set of critical skills and competencies that are arguably necessary to survival in this age of unprecedented global possibilities and crises. And that's a surprising claim to some people that we need what English teachers teach for survival. Although I did have one wonderful student who, when I made that comment in class, raised her hand immediately and said, poetry saved my life. <laughs> I loved her immediately. <laughs> But let me speak from my own discipline and just reflect for a few moments about what reading a literary work involves and why the skills that it involves are so important. First of all, it involves close attention to how words work. Care for precision, for suggestiveness, for etymological variations, for nuance, and especially care for definition. We want to produce students who really care about the definitions of words so that when they hear um, overused and often abstract words like moving ahead or progress or way of life or a term like success, that they'll nail that person and say, what do you mean by that? What does success look like? In what terms? What do you mean by moving ahead? From what? Toward what? Those are important questions to raise every time you hear them. Secondly, I think that it's important to apply this kind of attention to words, not only to English, but to other languages. We want students who don't speak only English. It's irresponsible, I think, at this point in history to be monolingual. And I think that that's something Americans urgently need to address. But also to recognize how language structures our most basic grasp of reality, so that you might reflect on the fact that since you speak English, you have a subject, verb, object understanding of um, the world, and that it's very different from the configuration you get if, you, if your native language is Mandarin Chinese. And so we are deeply embedded in the culturally um, contaminated, if you like, languages that we speak. And we really need to get outside our own language frames in order to understand that embeddedness. Reading literature also involves understanding how narrative, lyric, and dramatic modes of expression allow us to organize experience in different terms, and that we need each of those in order to give us a particular angle of vision on the truth. Um, a grasp of literary genres can equip us to cross generations and to cross cultures with a sense of how different communities find ways to tell the truth, how different communities strategize talent, truth telling and to think about the purposes for storytelling within different communities and certainly a grasp of literary genre is necessary to reading scripture properly you simply don't read the Psalms the way you read the book of Revelation and you don't read that the way you read the book of Mark and I think we all know that but it is uh, we do live in a culture in which a lot of people don't make those distinctions and it's it, those are dangerously that those oversimplifications are dangerous. Reading literature also enables people to recognize the power of images and metaphors and to think about the logic of metaphor. For instance, to call a healing strategy a battle, and this is language, military language comes up a lot in American medicine, is to frame the business of healing in a way that often is not helpful for people. Or to call a war that ravages the lives and livelihoods of tens of thousands of innocent civilians, to liken that to climbing a high mountain, or even to doing a job, is a deceptive use of language that obscures the realities of war. This is a time when we really need to take account of those realities. To use marketing language to talk about education as though we're delivering a product may also be destructive in the assumptions it cultivates about what we're doing. So I think to cultivate the habit of um, reflecting on our own usages, our own metaphors, um, to consider what we mean when we borrow an image, how far analogies can go before they break down, all of these are practices that go way beyond reading Chaucer. Reading literature also involves us in understanding point of view and framing and perspective. Understanding that every story is told from within a cultural or political or theological or philosophical frame of reference. 